Kentucky. Uh, I'm the thematic spokesperson on European Local Democracy Week for the Congress of Local and Regional Authorities at the Council of Europe. Mr. Mayor, dear colleagues and dear participants, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I'd like to thank you, Mr. Mayor, for your kind invitation. It's a great pleasure for me to be here today, even as we continue to live and work in a very special circumstance this year. The current situation makes it difficult for us, the local and regional elected representatives, to work and to fulfill our responsibilities in delivering more vibrant and supportive ser um, services to our citizens. Nevertheless, over the past months, we have been taking full advantage of the opportunities presented by new technologies for both service delivery and engaging citizens in our communities. And today I'm happy to be part of this webinar and celebrate the European Local Democracy Week thanks to these modern technologies which bring us and our citizens together. Uh, Volonga Municipality has always been active in the framework of the European Local Democracy Week and I must say that you and our other partners from across the 47 member states of the Council of Europe have been a true inspiration for us, showing examples of ingenuity and creativity in the current conditions. As spokesperson on European Local Democracy Week for the Council of Europe, I welcome this initiative and take this opportunity to invite all of you, all conference participants, to engage actively in European Local Democracy Week, the ELDW initiative, to check out all the best practices on the website that could be organised uh, in your own cities, but also contribute to your own examples that can be shared with others. The ELDW team of the Congress Secretariat and myself, we're more than happy to communicate with you and to answer your questions. As you know, the theme of the 2020 edition of the European Local Democracy Week is Local Democracy Building Trust. In the Council of Europe Congress, we attach a great importance to building trust to, between citizens and local authorities, which is even more important as we are facing the COVID crisis. Today's citizens' confidence in public authorities and institutions of governance, especially in their communities, is crucial if we're to manage this crisis successfully together. At the same time, the pandemic compels us to work even harder on communicating with citizens and engaging them in public debate and decision making. We must find new and innovative ways of doing so. The crisis has highlighted the key role of local governance in protecting citizens, and we need to sustain both citizens' participation and their confidence in our capacity to deliver effective responses and continue to provide services. We must show resilience and we must make sure that the pandemic does not lead to the lockdown of local democracy. Today, many activities are taking place through the use of digital tools. And I can see some wonderful slides on the, uh, on the screen here, which is fantastic. Um, but strengthening online engagement requires digital skills. Therefore, I'd like to stress the need for greater support to those who have limited financial and technological opportunities to access services online or participate in online events. Local and regional authorities should be paying special attention to vulnerable and disadvantaged groups as we strive for inclusion in the digital age. We might think of special facilities or funds to support such groups, to engage with them and encourage their initiatives. But local and regional authorities themselves might need support from higher levels, national and European, because entire communities could find themselves in a vulnerable or disadvantaged situation too. National and European support for the local and regional level is therefore crucial for post-crisis recovery and for adapting our societies and communities to the new conditions. In this regard, financing citizenship related initiatives remains vital for bringing public action closer to citizens' needs and for ensuring its ultimate effectiveness. In this regard, activities such as participatory budgeting is one of the most successful tools of involving citizens in decision making. Volonga Municipality has been engaged in participatory budgeting, especially for young people, for many years as part of, part of European Local Democracy Week activities. And I invite local and regional authorities present, present here to look at the best practices of our host and to replicate them in your communities. There is some wonderful good practice for, that Volonga can show to us all. We are convinced that trust between citizens and authorities is key to the good functioning of democracy and the ultimate glue that holds our communities together. Local authorities play a crucial role in strengthening public confidence as they are at the front line of addressing citizens' concerns. The local and regional level can help significantly to reconnect with citizens and to restore confidence in democratic processes and institutions. And today, this can be done online as well. Once again, thank you for having me today and for organising this important event in such difficult times. Thank you. 
Obrigado. Thank you very much, Brioni. I will now give the floor to the Mayor of Alongo City Council, José Manuel Ribeiro. Well, well, hello everybody. It's, uh, I was with part of this audience in the morning and now we are opening with these wonderful words of Brioni. I want to say thank you, Brioni, and also to the team in the European Council uh, your words are really great. You cannot imagine uh, the effect of your words because after seven years and two days as mayor, it's very good to hear your voice and your, your, your message. Me and my team, because we work hard to, you know, to give more power, to empower people, to empower communities. That's the idea. When I was, I just want to say, let me say one thing. When I before I was elected mayor, I had this, um, this, I was always asking myself, what do you want to do as a mayor? One of the things I want to do is to, you know, when I, one of these days, when I go away to another thing, and uh, I would like to see a community, a very strong community, you know, a community of 100,000 people, very, very active, very, very powerful, uh, understanding the importance of participation, understanding the importance of uh, representative democracy, participatory democracy, of uh, engaging, understanding, understanding what is politics, what is local life, what is everything. So that's why we invest a lot of our time and our resources in these kind of initiatives. Not only the the European Local Week democracy, but also during all the year we have several initiatives. I want to say also hello to several friends here, Nelson Diaz from the Portuguese uh, uh, network of Portuguese of uh, uh, participative uh, municipalities that, that I have the great pleasure to be the president, and Adria Duarte from uh, uh, UCLG, the, uh, our colleague from Barcelona and also from the Participatory Democracy Observatory, and also our um, our members of the panel, uh, Mayor Calisto Cossa. You know, Mayor Calisto Cossa is really a great person. You have to listen, very interesting. I really admire his work in, in Mozambique. And uh, Christina Reinsalo from Estonia. She's a, a, a good friend from, from Volongo and, from, and from, from myself also. Um, and also uh, say good, say thanks to Shin Gyeong Gu from South Korea, uh, Amelia Loy from Australia, Dominique Olivier, Greta Still, uh, that's going to share with us uh, all their expertise. What I want to say <clears throat> in this day during a pandemic crisis is that it's reinforced the words of Brioni we have to be very careful with this uh, crisis we're living because of course it's a, it's a health crisis but it's not all, all only an health crisis we have to be careful with this um, environment that we are living nowadays because from my experience in portugal we have this challenge of uh, avoiding that the coronavirus crisis, it's a kind of justification for a lot of things. For example, to, you know, to stop doing experiments within demo participatory democracy. We see a lot of, in, in a lot of uh, uh, municipalities, in a lot of places, people are using the coronavirus excuse to say, okay, let's stop and let's adapt. And when you see in, in several cases, they don't uh, return. It's a kind of excuse. And, and that's a, a great threat we have. Because one thing that I see with this pandemic is that we must understand the importance of democracy. I always have this idea to under, I have nothing against 
<clears throat> people from China, I'm only talking about the system we live. When we compare a democracy environment with another one, we can see an obvious difference. It is almost impossible to, you know, to uh, hide the signs of a pandemic in a democracy. If you live in a dictatorship, you can control the information. That's one of the best examples we have to see the difference of living in a democracy with all its faults. We know that democracy is not a perfect system. Of course, we have to perfect it every day like a garden. It's true. I, I agree with that. But if we try to see a, a very important feature of democratic environments, democratic communities, it's the question of information. We have a lot of information. We live with information. We need to understand information. And that information, it is a, an important part of, of democracy uh, life. And it, I say this because it's something that I am very um, worried with this uh, question of uh, the way people are resisting this virus, this uh, pandemic, this uh, climate that was created with this pandemic. We, I think, when I say we, we, politicians, citizens, organizations, everybody, we have, we, we should, you know, stimulate people to resist, to adopt a resistance attitude, a kind of, I'm talking about, I'm talking in a, in a broad way, in a very broad way, health resistance, economic resistance, social resistance, political resistance, democratic resistance, mental resistance, cultural resistance, education resistance, this idea of resistance, because it's, in my opinion, the best way to prepare the phasing out for the after the coronavirus, because we are going to, to uh, return to what we call uh, normal times, and we have to return it with our democracy strength and that's my, my this this is nowadays my uh, worst uh, uh, preoccupation this uh, effect in uh, people attitude in institutions attitude of this crisis so i hope it's a good time to share all our thoughts about citizenship about financing citizenship we do it for the last uh, years, and a lot of uh, municipalities do it, and uh, I think that's the way. Just have to go forward. So thank you very much, obrigado todos, and have a nice day of uh, sharing, because that's one of the striking points of democracy: debating and sharing ideas and accepting that others don't agree with us. That's also a very important characteristic of democracy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your intervention, Mr. President. I pass the word to the moderators of this session, Adria Duarte and Nelson Diaz, that will guide this conference. Thank you. Oh, hello, hello, everyone. I hope you can hear me well. Uh, thank you, Claudia. Thank you, Mayor. So as uh, the mayor introduced, I'm the coordinator of the International Observatory on Participatory Democracy. This is an international network of local regional governments, research centers, and NGOs working to improve local democracy through better and large participation of citizens. We work alongside the UCLG, the United Cities and Local Governments, who is that's the large local authorities organizations worldwide. And we are very proud that, the, that to have Alongo as one of the more engaged cities in, in our network. So I will be moderating this discussion session with uh, Nelson Diaz, 
who is a World Bank consultant for the implementation of the participatory budget, and he's the, the coordinator of the Porto, Portugal Participa Network. So in this session, different experts and representatives of cities and civil society organizations from various regions of the world will explain several experiences of citizen participation and participatory democracy. We, we will see in very different contexts how this participation of citizens in public affairs is articulated with the classical participatory budget, also with digital tools, with face-to-face -face meetings. And some of those challenges we want to discuss is how to achieve a better public policies, a better democracy, and social inclusion in our cities and communities. We also highlight in this session the importance of international collaboration to share experiences, technologies, and reflections, and to overcome common challenges. And with no doubt, the impact of COVID-19 on participation will be also discussed. So let's introduce the six speakers that will present these experiences. We will start in Australia with Amelia Loy. Uh, she runs two organizations in Australia, Engage2, a consultancy involving democracy by involving community and government, and a non-profit and a non-for-profit organization, the Center for Civic Innovation, that powers our lead change. She will speak about the mechanism of public participation in Australia, why she won't use the term citizen engagement anymore, and how community engagement is being impacted by COVID. So after Australia, we will move to to Asia, to South Korea, with Dr. Chin Yong-gu. He taught at Chonam National University for, for 31 years. He has been the director of Guangzhou International Center with 20 staff since 1999. And this organization has been organizing the World Human Rights Cities Forum that has been taken uh, 10 days, some days ago, which changes his research interested again from language to human rights cities and right to the city. So he will present experience of this very nice South Korean city. Then we will move to Africa with Calisto Kose. Calisto Kose is the mayor of Matola, a city of more than 1 million inhabitants next to Maputo, the capital of Mozambique. He's currently the president of ANAM, the municipal government association in Mozambique, and he, he was the president of the IODP in 2016, year where they organized the 16th IODP conference. It was a very large and interesting uh, meeting. He's been involved in several networks at national and international level. So he will be representing the city and also the, the Mozambican municipalities. Then we will also have Christina Reinzalu. She's the head of the e-democracy program in Estonia. She has a PhD in media and communications and 15 years of experience in consulting governments and local authorities on open governments and civic engagement using ICT. She will speak a few words about e-governance in Estonia and in more detail about her experience in the city of Tartu. Then uh, Dominique Olivier, who is the, the president of the Montreal's Office of Public Consultation since September 2014. She has over 25 years of project organizational and communication management experience. Her career is also marked with volunteer work in numerous national and international community organizations. She has written many texts and memoranda dealing with issues of cultural diversity, civic participation, and adult education. Under her management, the OCPM experienced a diversification of its consultation tools, resulting in a significant increase in citizen engagement. It should also be noted that she was responsible also for another OEDP conference in 2017. And finally, the, the last but not the, the the last speaker was, uh, will be Greta Lucero Rios. Greta is the founder and president of OYIN, a citizen empowerment Mexican NGO. Greta has more than 10 years of experience working in the nonprofit sector and eight being the head of an organization. She holds a BA in international relations from Tech de Monterrey and an advanced master's degree on international dispute settlement from the Geneva Graduate Institute. She has also worked for the Mexican government as an independent consultant on human rights, international humanitarian law, and uh, other issues. I also want to emphasize that during the session, Carlos Souza Santos, a graphic designer, will be making some illustrations related on the presentation. So you can fix Carlos' window to see how it works, and at the end of the, of the session, uh, he will show the, his, his illustration. So um, it's time for the, for the speakers, just a few like technical comments, keep the microphones off, and of course, you can make comments and questions through the chat. At the end of the session, the speakers will answer your question. 
So I give the floor to Amelia Loya for around 10, 10 minutes, and I see the role of moderation to Nelson Diaz for the presentations and the final debate. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Adria. Um, I'm Amelia Loy from Sydney, Australia. It's almost one o'clock in the morning here. So please forgive me if I don't stay to engage with you and answer questions. Uh, but you can get in touch with me through my website, engage2.com.au. Um, before I start a presentation, I'd like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, the traditional owners of the land which I'm coming to you from and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Uh, stakeholder engagement in, in Australia is quite well recognised as a public service and it's a pretty significant industry. So I'm going to move through my presentation talking about the different levels of government and what they're doing to engage with community and the kind of mechanisms that they're using. And I will touch on that point that Adria said, which is why I won't use that term citizen engagement anymore. I use community engagement. And that's a really important difference for me. So I'll share with you why as I move through this presentation. Um, so we also in Australia, one thing that I'm very proud of as an Australian and somebody who's been working in the engagement industry for a long time is we've actually got quite a strong uh, civic tech and engaged tech industry used around the world in different, um, by different governments around the world. So that's something to look up if you weren't aware of that already. Um, there's quite a few different types of community engagement done here in Australia. Community relations is by far the biggest uh, sector of the, the ways that the community can participate uh, in government processes. And what I mean by community relations is it's when you tell people that you're gonna build a road, a bridge, a dam, and you ask them what can be done to reduce the impact on them. Um, it's essential to risk and social impact management. Um, and it makes a small difference to a project but it can make a real difference to people's lives. So that type of community engagement is done by a lot of people here. And as I move through the different levels of government, I'll talk about why that's still an important form of community engagement, but it doesn't involve people as much in the bigger decisions that a government are making. Um, so then of course there's stakeholder and community engagement in policy development and delivery. This is the type that I really like to do and I focus mostly on environmental policy and planning. And I'm trying to make this type of engagement more open, representative, deliberative, and ongoing. We have quite a strong movement in Australia towards more deliberative methodologies. And I think it's becoming much more, rec much more recognized that we need to increase the representation in our participatory processes. And I would say that's quite common across the board now that at all levels of government, they're now looking at how they increase representation and make participatory processes more deliberative. Uh, I also work at the systems level. We are part of the Open Government Partnership in Australia, so is New Zealand, who both have national action plans for open government. So we're making some progress there uh, and implementing technologies, social data analytics and relationship management across organisations and levels of government. And community engagement is also used in research for service design and occasionally as a tool for economic and community development but not as much in, as it is in a lot of the developing countries as a strategy for increasing um, the way people can participate in shaping their community, not just influencing government decisions. So there's three levels of government here in Australia, federal, state, local. Um, at the federal level, engagement is a bit limited. It's a very big country here. So to get around to everybody face-to-face -face is quite hard. So most of the face-to-face -face engagements done in our capital cities, which of course limits the ability for people in regional areas to participate. One advancement though, that the federal government are, uh, have made in public participation is that they're now experimenting with the use of artificial intelligence to analyze and report data collected. And in fact, the, the Australian government invested a million dollars into a digitally enabled community engagement solution a couple of years ago, which is now being used to pull data from uh, forms that are used on their websites to then analyze that data and feed that back into policy making processes. State governments, we've got six states and two territories here in Australia and 
they do a lot of community engagement, but it differs between different types of agencies. Um, in most states, each government agency has its own engagement portal. So as a member of the public, it can be hard to find out what government's doing and how you can participate. In the transport and infrastructure departments, it's very typical to consult people about strategic plans. And then uh, when the project's approved, to engage the community in a more of that community relations style of engagement, which is more about managing the impacts and the issues associated with the delivery of that project. But those agencies have really big budgets and really big project teams, like more than a hundred people engaging with the community at one time, not just on a single project, but on multiple projects across the state. So they'll each have their own engagement portal. They'll often use um, map-based engagement tools. And we're even seeing um, more use of not virtual engagement and not just the kind of engagement that we're doing right now, but even engagement in VR for the visualization of projects and inviting input from people um, in the virtual world. So they, they've got budgets, they've got big teams and they're being quite creative, but the level of influence is still a little bit limited on those kinds of projects. Our other big state government departments that are engaging, of course, are the environmental departments, and they tend to be much more open, um, more willing to work with stakeholders. They're inviting input into regulation and also management strategies. So they do a bit more co-design, co-delivery, and a bit of citizen science. And then I, again, I don't like that term citizen science because I find it doesn't include all of the other residents in the country who might want to participate in those kinds of processes. Um, participatory budgeting is quite limited here in Australia. It's more about, um, it's more about showing trade-offs and communicating about budgets than it is actually about allocating budgets. We have had one state government, one of the largest state governments in Australia experiment with the use of participatory budgeting and they were very successful because they ran an extremely open and collaborative process to allocate grant money. And they worked with the local governments, that's what I mean by collaborative, in looking at how they maximise the impact of that investment into those communities by getting the people proposing the projects to work closely with the local governments to then actually scale the, the rate of change and the impact in that particular community. Any member of the public could participate in that process, um, but in another state who tried to copy what that state had done, it wasn't as successful. They didn't have as much resourcing behind the project. They didn't reach as broad a section of the population, and they actually excluded people who were not citizens. They weren't able to participate in that process. So a lot of taxpayers uh, weren't able to participate in the participatory budgeting process. So there's there's my reasoning, one of my big reasons for not wanting to use that term citizen uh, engagement and rather to use community engagement. Local government. There are 128 local governments in New South Wales, the state that I live in, where Sydney is. That's so, that's, there's a lot of local governments across this country. I think one state has 177. So there's a lot of movements here in Australia to amalgamate the local governments, which is highly controversial. Um, we've also had some really interesting uh, limitations on the rates that local governments can charge because in our constitution, our state governments determine um, what the local governments can do uh, or should do in terms of engagement. And I'll touch on that in just a moment when I get to the COVID part of my presentation. But just to give you an overarching view of what, hap what happens in terms of engagement in local governments here, it's more continuous, it's more frequent, but it is more sporadic. Um, despite every local government in Australia having its own online engagement portal, they're actually a little bit disorganised when it comes to sharing information about the types of people that they've been engaging. So you'll have your economic development team, your planning department, uh, your communications team, social services, youth engagement, all engaging with the community but not sharing their stakeholder lists all the data that they're collecting on their projects. So often they're asking the same questions of the same people twice, which isn't great for trust. 
Um, some of the bigger cities have actually set up dedicated engagement teams to deal with this and are now starting to look at their IT and their information architecture and the way they manage relationships more holistically across their organization and looking at engagement, community engagement as a core part of the way they serve their customers, their community, their stakeholders. Uh, so some, yeah, some local governments have participated with participatory budgeting, but as I said before, it's mostly about collecting preferences and demonstrating trade-offs. None, as far as I'm aware, have really actually let the community allocate budget, including even the community grant budget. So it's been really wonderful to watch what's happening over there in Europe and we're trying to push it. But we're just not quite there yet here in Australia. We have been pretty progressive though when it comes to things like mini publics and citizens juries, um, but they're mostly done on big controversial projects and there has been varying success with those kinds of projects. So finally, um, about COVID. So the bad news is, like Jose said, some things are being pushed through with less consultation. Um, the good news about that is people are starting to realize, um, but as I said, with the different levels of government and the, the uh, acts in place that govern the way people are invited to participate, um, our Local Government Act and an Environmental uh, Protection Act, for example, one state actually changed that in the first week of COVID restrictions in Australia. Uh, and they did that to reduce the amount of red tape when it comes to approving, particularly planning projects, development applications, housing options, which of course is great in the long term for society in terms of providing those um, new, that new infrastructure and shovel, we call it the shovel ready policy here in Australia, when we have that kind of economic development. Um, but it actually means that the community are not consulted about those projects as much and there is not as much in the way of environmental impact assessed on that and those processes typically those environmental assessment processes are really critical for um, the way people can participate in uh, those kinds of decisions. Just finally the, the good news um, is that the people committed to engagement inside government I mentioned before there was a hundred just in one one government agency in one state, they're finally getting permission to invest in and use digital in more creative and holistic ways. And we're really starting to see an integration of not just the face-to-face -face methods with the digital methods, but an integration of digital methods. So virtual and online happening at the same time, a little bit more of that in capital investment into looking at that digital architecture, that information architecture, and really getting strategic about the way those organizations are managing relationships, valuing data from stakeholders, and really trying to like, encourage more representation in the way they're doing participation. So we're getting kind of, I think one simple way to sum that up is what we're getting is like a stacks on effect with um, the digital and creative methods actually starting to result in more effective uh, engagement and relationship management. Alvia? We're also seeing a little bit more creativity um, in um, I apologize civic for participation. But we sorry, are Nelson. The time limit. Sorry, I apologize for yep. you, but we are approaching the, the time limit for each presentation. Thank sure, you. Sure, sure. Thanks, Nelson. I'll just finish with um, just one summary statement, which I would say is that COVID is um, continuing to improve engagement in Australia. Uh, and yeah, practitioners are becoming much more of the need to include not just citizens, um, but also ratepayers and residents in their engagement. And once again, I'm sorry I can't stay for questions, but please feel free to get in touch if you'd like to reach out through engage2.com.au. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful Amelia. conference, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emily, for your interesting presentation on your work, what you, you are doing in Australia. Uh, it's a great way to know that we are not alone in this world. Um, and I want to, to remind uh, you, all the participants, that uh, at this conference with us, it's Carlos Souza Santos. He is designing the contents of the different presentations, and in the end, he will share with us uh, the result. It will be great. Um, and um, now I will pass the word to Mr. Chin from South Korea. 
and please do not exceed 10 minutes for your presentation. Thank you very much. I'm going to uh, have my PPT file shared with you all. Uh, You're not looking at... Yes, you, you can start. We can so, see your presentation. Yes, it's correct. Can you see mine? Yes, yes. We oh, can. I see. That's good. Yeah. So first, uh, <clears throat> brief introduction of my CD. It is a CD of 1.5 million population. The major industry includes uh, Kia Motors, which produces 600,000. Oh, no. Here. So uh, I have many titles here, but I will tell why later. So this is the brief introduction of the city. Major industry includes car factory, tire company, and then home electronics company. Yep. Sorry, sorry for interrupting you, but if you, yeah. if you can um, just show us the presentation because we are seeing another document in, in Korean. Oh. If you can change, I think you have a PowerPoint presentation. Now, can you see the PowerPoint file now or no, not? No, this is only text. I think it's open. You just need to, to, to choose the presentation that you have open. Again, then. Uh... I'm sorry for. No this. problem, no problem. Take your time. Can you see the file? Is it, yes. Is it? Now, oh, now we can see. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Thank you for your pointing it out. So uh, I have many titles, as you see here. I will show. Uh, I will tell why later. And then this is the brief introduction of the CD. In fact, the CD uh, is. In the 20th century of Korea, there were eight major uprisings, and then two took place in Gwangju, so which shows the character of the city. And then uh, the, the uprising in 1980 in May was the was co is considered as the beginning of modern Korean democratization. So this is a brief, uh, brief process of Korean democratization uh, beginning in 1980, the movement, new constitution, uh, civilian government for the first time, and then first the civilian government from opposition party. Finally, we have National Commission of Human Rights. So the current level of Korean democracy is considered quite high, but we have very short history. So because of the uh, past heritage of the city, 
we have many uh, places of democracy and human rights. So growing, the, the people growing in this city, they are growing, uh, being exposed to many institutions like National Cemetery, May 18 UNESCO archives, uh, the first pro the provincial hall, which was the stronghold of the citizen army at the, uh, at the uprising, which was converted into Asia Culture Center, and then the place where the uprising began, something like that. So we have, in addition to the uh, places, we have many institutions to protect human rights or promote human rights in the city. So I will skip this part, which would be quite familiar to you all as well. And then we also have devices for participation, like uh, many councils, round table, committees, uh, human rights impact assessment. When we uh, have new ordinance, the ordinance should be reviewed by scholars as well as local uh, NGO groups on its impact to human rights. So we have many, uh, and then basic plans for human rights. So all these kind of activities, citizen groups are invited. Then one of the interesting aspect of the city is that the Guangzhou city has the highest number of NGO groups per 1,000, no, per 100,000 people. We have about 40 organizations. We also have highest number of women councilmen in the local council, in the city council. Even though 34% is quite low in European standard, this is the highest proportion of women representatives in city council. Uh, in the uh, COVID-19 uh, control, the government prohibited gathering with more than 100 people outdoors, 50 people indoors. But the ultra conservative groups staged rallies in uh, recently, so the, in Seoul, and then there were 79 buses from local cities, provinces to Seoul. And then out of about 80 buses, there was only one bus participating, which means very low participation. So the people here are actively collaborating. Majority of the people are actively con collaborating with the government in containment of the coronavirus. But the one of the most important devices of uh, human rights or the, the participation or human rights promotion, I believe is education, human rights education. So all city hall uh, employees are required to take five hours of human rights classes every year. So human rights is a common or comfortable word in this part of city, Guangzhou city. Even though because of the uh, long history of dictatorship, human rights was considered uh, negative uh, feeling to the general public. But in this part, in, in this city, it is quite comfortable to all people. Uh, so I want to talk about uh, an example of Guangzhou International Center as a, a device of participation because I talked about number of uh, NGO groups in Guangzhou city because I consider the organizations are channels of participation, not only systems of the city hall. So uh, the, the Guangzhou International Center for which I am working is uh, one of the uh, important channels for myself and then other people to participate. I became, I work as a uh, director of the center since 1999 when it was first time created. And then it, uh, it 
collaborated with the city hall very closely uh, with the support of 1,000 fee-paying members. So the fee-paying members' part participation provided about 10% of our budget. Additional cultural classes provide us 10%, another 10% uh, of revenue, and then 80% from our collaboration with the city hall or national government or other organizations. Uh, the most important services of the center is providing uh, information or participation services to international, partic international residents here, as well as Korean citizens. But the most important, uh, as important, uh, this, is, this is us. And then one of the most important uh, services we provide is World Human Rights Cities Forum which we started in 2011, but my center began to organize it into in, from 2014. Now it has grown about six times as big than when we started it. It attracted about 2,000 participants last year from 250, uh, oh no, 44 countries, 130 cities. This year we attracted 2,700 participants from 236 cities of 20, no, 76 countries. So it has become grown, it has grown quite quickly because of our contribution. So without volunteer participation as well as fee paying members support, this kind of uh, achievement would not have been possible. So uh, I wanted to show you my personal uh, example of participation as well as funding. Uh, the funding seems to be one of the most important part or difficult part in management, but uh, the membership fee has been uh, seed money and then the seed money has been effectively um, utilized by uh, our participation in promoting the CD as a human rights city. Thank you again for the invitation uh, to, for me to share my experience with you all. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chin, for your interesting presentation on the city of Guangzhou in South Korea. It was a very useful for all of us. We know, actually we know the, the Guangzhou Prize of Human Rights and Democracy and Peace that your city organizes every year. It is an inspiration for all of us. Thank you, Mr. Shin. And okay. now I want to pass the word, the, the word to President Kalisto from Matola in Mozambique. And the President Kalisto will speak in Portuguese. Muito obrigado. Não se consegue me ouvir? Perfeitamente. Obrigado por ter participado também neste, nesta conferência. Tudo bem. Muito obrigado. Gostaria, em primeiro lugar, de saudar a uh, todos os participantes, uh, saudar os organizadores desta conferência, numa altura muito difícil para, para o mundo, que, por conta desta, desta, desta pandemia. Saudar o uh, meu amigo, o presidente de Balão, uh, por nos juntar nesta, nesta conferência, para trazermos as experiências que nós temos uh, uh, da nossa da nossa governação a nível dos municípios e não só o processo de participação cidadã que é o apanágio uh, de quase todas as cidades mundiais. Uh, indo concretamente para a experiência que nós pretendemos partilhar da nossa da nossa cidade, da Matola, dizer que uh, é importante que uh, passamos a conhecer uh, a Matola, uh, certamente que alguns participantes que, 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 que estão neste nesta conferência já cá estiveram, mas a Matola é uma das grandes cidades do nosso do nosso país, é uma cidade a, a mais industrializada do nosso do nosso país e a nossa luta com o município é continuar a manter esta esta linha de, de, de manter a nossa cidade como a mais industrializada. Devo dizer que 60% das empresas que operam em Moçambique estão aqui na nossa cidade. Do ponto de vista populacional, é o maior município uh, do, do país e está crescendo uh, cada, 
cada vez mais, é só imaginar, temos aqui eh, bairros nossos que são 42, que alguns deles têm a população que distritos eh, do, do país não têm, e alguns deles têm a população até superior a algumas cidades africanas eh, e não só. Uh, uh, dizer que o município da Matola, neste momento, para além uh, dessa, uh, desse compromisso que tem com, com os matolenses, e porque é um município que tem uma população dinâmica, uh, tem colaboradores dinâmicos, uh, que uh, sabem o que quer do ponto de vista de, de metas e focos, neste momento é o um município que está a presidir a Associação Nacional dos municípios de Moçambique. O nosso país, no seu todo, tem 53 municípios e são esses municípios que, para além de promover e defender o interesse das autarquias como parceiros do governo, também eh, trabalham na busca de soluções do ponto de vista de eh, a cooperação intermunicipal e também a cooperação regional, eh, eh, para não dizer eh, a cooperação internacional. Todos os municípios eh, do país, liderados neste momento pelo município da Matola, eh, têm estado empenhados na busca de soluções, principalmente neste momento em que estamos todos a lutar contra esta pandemia. Devo dizer que Moçambique é um dos países que, do ponto de vista de controle, cada participação dos municípios em todos os municípios, do ponto de vista de controle desta pandemia, estamos eh, com bons sinais. Uh, uh, temos uh, 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 situações de infecções, mas uh, podemos dizer que uh, a situação está controlada, tendo em conta que é um trabalho de participação de quase todos os municípios, em diferentes municípios, no combate a esta, a esta pandemia. Olhando para aquilo que é o nosso município, trazendo a nossa experiência, que uh, temos as balizas que norteiam a nossa governação, uh, nós, sendo um país vasto, com diferentes culturas, nós defendemos a componente da Unidade Nacional, a Paz e a Reconciliação Nacional. E na governação, para além da boa governação, defendemos a descentralização e o combate à corrupção, o desenvolvimento social e humano é outro pilar que, que, que não tem a nossa governação, o desenvolvimento da economia local e sustentabilidade financeira da Turquia é importante porque temos a consciência de que para podermos responder à demanda é preciso que busquemos todas as formas de financiar, quer seja através das receitas próprias e também a busca de, 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 de parcerias com as organizações internacionais que possam olhar para projetos que nós eh, desenhamos e que sejam projetos que são feitos em função daquilo que a população da nossa cidade eh, eh, almeja. Temos também o pilar de desenvolvimento de infraestruturas, prestação de serviços básicos aos municípios e também esta componente que nos junta hoje Uh, mais uma vez que tem a ver com a cooperação intermunicipal e cooperação internacional. E no caso da cooperação uh, internacional e, 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 e intermunicipal, uh, devo dizer que nós estamos num processo uh, 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 que está dentro do contexto da produção no qual as cidades e governos locais uh, reconhecem a importância e a necessidade de cooperarem, de estarem integrados em plataformas internacionais, de forma a buscar soluções para os problemas comuns. Esta, esta conferência é o espelho disso, que de fato esta troca de experiência nos permite trazer soluções para os problemas que nos afetam e atingimos os, os objetivos de desenvolvimento uh, sustentável. Uh, o município da Matola, uh, neste contexto de internacionalização, uh, tem portas abertas uh, para, para o mundo e já está afiliado a várias organizações internacionais estratégicas, como é o caso do OIDP, aliás, uh, poderei dar com mais detalhe, nós já presidimos o Observatório Internacional de Democracia Participativa, estamos filiados à CGMU, tem, estamos também no FMDV, e também na, na rede FAP e aderimos a projetos que visavam o fortalecimento da cooperação uh, Sul-Sul, que é um projeto da cooperação entre Moçambique e, 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 e Portugal. Um dos aspectos que nós fomos buscar como experiência, estamos a implementar, é que está a ter sucesso no contexto da participação cidadã, 
tem a ver com as ferramentas de participação. Nós eh, temos ligações muito fortes com municípios do Brasil, no caso concreto a Prefeitura de Canoas, no, na altura o prefeito Jairo estava a liderar esta prefeitura e eh, uma das experiências que fomos buscar tem a ver com o orçamento participativo. Felizmente, eh, essa foi uma das ferramentas que eh, serviu de base para que pudéssemos reescrever o nosso, o nosso projeto de governação, fazendo com que o próprio município, o próprio cidadão matulense pudesse participar no processo de definição clara dos objetivos e das prioridades que pudessem colocar alguns bairros nossos com projetos municipais. Estamos a implementar, aliás, fomos até criar a Rede Nacional de Orçamento Participativo, numa demonstração clara de que as pessoas, afinal de contas, sabem o que querem e podem, olhando para o meio habitacional, definir claramente o, 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 as prioridades em termos de infraestruturas e muitas outras necessidades que a população tem. Temos uma ferramenta de participação cidadã de extrema importância, que é a presidência municipal sem paredes. Isto é, é decidimos que era importante que nós, como autarca, devíamos encontrar um espaço, quer seja quinzenalmente ou mensalmente, é, de nos deslocarmos a um determinado bairro e lá discutir a vida da, 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 da cidade, discutir os problemas é, de, de, dos munícipes e resolver também os problemas dos munícipes naquele local, felizmente tivemos, estamos a ter sucesso com esta, com esta ferramenta e continuamos a implementar e nos mostra claramente qual é o pensamento que o nosso município tem, qual é o objetivo que o nosso município pretende alcançar, o que é que o nosso município quer com o processo de governação autárquica. Temos também uma ferramenta que é a governação aberta, que é esta interação permanente que nós temos estado a fazer com o, o, os munícipes. Porque a mobilidade urbana é uma agenda internacional, para não dizer também nossa como país, também é uma outra ferramenta que temos estado a implementar, que é a presidência na tribunal, que é o presidente ir lá ver como, para, para perceber como é que efetivamente somos transportados como munícipes de uma forma cômoda, de uma, de uma forma sustentável e, 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 e de uma forma segura. Dizia eu que nós, nesta abertura internacional, e através de uma das ferramentas que mencionei, no caso concreto, orçamento participativo, eh, acabamos nos filiando ao, ao Observatório Internacional da Democracia Participativa. Participamos no Brasil e em 2015 fomos eleitos para presidir eh, este observatório por um período de um ano. Eh, disse muito bem, Adriano, que... Eh, eh, de fato, organizamos esta conferência passado um ano eh, com sucesso. Tivemos cá mais de, de 2 mil delegados que vieram cá a, 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 a dar, o seu, dar as, suas, as suas experiências. Esteve cá a falar há bem pouco tempo o representante da Coreia, esteve é, é, é conosco aqui e trouxe a, a experiência da Coreia e nós agradecemos. E muitas outras que nós, 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 nós partilhamos em, 2000, em 2016. Neste momento estamos no FMDV, conforme disse também, na Rede FALP, e demonstrando claramente que somos uma cidade que primeiro priorizamos a, 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 a pessoa humana. A pessoa humana porque é o objeto de toda uma governação. É através das pessoas que nós vamos definir claramente o que é que a cidade, qualquer que seja, deve fazer para a satisfação das necessidades básicas de, de, das pessoas. É, devo dizer que com o EDP não há dúvidas que a Matola passou a ser conhecida, vários foram os ganhos que nós tivemos, é, os munícipes da nossa cidade, conforme disse, é, é o município mais populoso neste momento, é, já sabem claramente o que é uma cooperação internacional, já sabem Uh, 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 praticamente quais são os objetivos dos governantes, nesse caso do nosso, do, do, nosso, do nosso município e sabem definir claramente quais são as prioridades uh, 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 que devem, devem escolher para poder uh, exigir que é de todo o direito uh, que sejam tomadas em consideração. Nós, neste momento, do ponto de vista de 
financiamento à cidadania, para além de olharmos para aquilo que é a posição interna, temos ligações com o projeto Aston, que tem como objetivo o reforço do sistema de finanças públicas, e, e, e também estamos a trabalhar com médicos do mundo, que tem trazido algumas soluções para o componente de financiamento, e há projetos de orçamento participativo que são financiados pelo Conselho Municipal, conforme disse, esses projetos eh, são definidos eh, com os munícipes, os munícipes é que nos indicam claramente o que é que nós precisamos fazer, quer seja o centro de saúde, vias de acesso, eh, eh, até postos policiais e, 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 e muito mais. Eh, nós estamos neste momento num projeto também de extrema importância, olhando para os munícipes, tem a ver com a mobilidade urbana. Estamos a trabalhar com, com, com a Agência Francesa de Desenvolvimento e é um projeto que, do ponto de vista metropolitano, vai melhorar o, o processo de mobilidade e não só. É que não se pode olhar para a mobilidade sem se é, é, pôr é, também em paralelo à questão da gestão correta do solo urbano que é para permitir que esta mobilidade seja feita de uma forma eficiente e, e eficaz. Nós estamos a trabalhar com, 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 com a Autoridade eh, eh, Metropolitana dos Transportes e com o financiamento da agência eh, eh, francesa para a melhoria deste, de, deste, de, de, deste grande, grande objetivo que é a mobilidade Uh, 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 urbana. Já participamos uh, uh, numa conferência em Londres, também financiado pelo Economic and Social Research Council, que era para olhar para essa questão que me referencia, que tem a ver com a mobilidade urbana, que é também uma agenda de caráter, de caráter mundial. Presidente, e, temos... Temos... temos que nos aproximar do fim da sua apresentação. E... Já estamos quase no fim. Uh, neste momento, não estamos... Uh, 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 direcionados à criação da rede da mulher autárquica, a mobilização de apoio a parceiros locais e internacionais para responder esses objetivos e também a criação de, 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 de uma rede autárquica da lusofonia. Em suma, dizer que a Matola é uma cidade aberta, a Matola neste momento, conforme diz, está a liderar uma Associação Nacional dos Municípios e acreditamos que com esta experiência que nós já estamos a adquirir, vai nos ajudar a manter a nossa cidade no panorama mundial. E muito obrigado, Nelson. Mais uma vez, obrigado pelo convite e obrigado por termos nos permitido partilhar a experiência da nossa cidade. Obrigado. Muito obrigado, Presidente Calisto, pela sua apresentação e por ter partilhado connosco o trabalho que está a fazer na Matola. Para além de, para além de tudo o que disse, serviu também para matar um pouco de saudades de Moçambique, terra com quem com a qual eu tenho, digamos, uma relação afetiva muito grande, porque trabalhei aí durante seis anos, sete anos, eh, apoiando vários processos de participação, inclusive com a ANAM, criando a sua Estratégia Nacional de Governação Participada, com o Eduardo Nogonha. Saudações para, vos, para a vossa equipa. E muito obrigado. Obrigado. And so, in about 30, 40 minutes, we traveled between Australia, South Korea, and now Mozambique, and now we go to Estonia, in Europe, to listen to the presentation of Cristina. Cristina, thank you very much for your participation in this conference. You have the word. Thank you very much. So, yes, I tried to share my, my screen. I hope you can see it. Can you see it? Yes, perfect. Yeah, perfect. So, thank you all. And, and well, first of all, it's my pleasure and honor to be with you virtually today. And, and to share some of my very quite personal experiences. I have been, as said, I have been consulting municipalities uh, for more than 15 years uh, on how to use technology for interaction with citizens and also how to crowdsource, how to consult citizens using technology, but also how to co-create solutions to to all sorts of problems and and find better and smarter uh, decisions, and uh, but to start with, I would I will will walk you through today through some some uh, 
most important aspects, in my opinion, uh, when we talk about the engagement, such as context, what we need to consider when we start any kind of engagement initiative. Then, as said, I touch upon my personal experiences when we started uh, implementing uh, all sorts of civic engagement experiments and initiatives in my city, which goes already back to 2010. And then a few words about participatory budgeting, but, but mostly on how we consider the E, the te technology component when we started participatory budgeting. But let me start with, with general context, uh, uh, which I think is important when we talk about digital engagement. Uh, well, Estonia can be considered and we like to call us as the coolest digital society and coolest quite literally so because we are in the northern, far northern part of, of Europe uh, surrounded by, by uh, Finland, Sweden, Russia and Latvia. But coolest digitally, yeah, I think we can say so because Estonia was first implementing uh, electronic voting, uh, actually internet voting, uh, already 2005 nationwide way. Then we were the first uh, country where e-tax declaration was already possible 2001. Skype was invented in Estonia and mobile parking was, was also implemented first in Estonia. Why I'm talking about this, I mean, Estonia really used the opportunity when we liberated us from Soviet occupation 30 years ago, technology was already available and we saw the opportunity, the window of opportunity to start using, to, to, to implement, to integrate technology and as a solution for creating an open and inclusive society. And uh, it is very important uh, also that this was the success story grew out of partnership between all different parts of society. I mean, very open-minded government, but also very, very trusting uh, uh, civil society. And it is also important to consider or to, 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 to talk a few, few words about uh, cornerstones and, and which also very important to create and maintain this trust of citizens towards technology, but also towards, uh, towards authorities, which is a, every single Estonian has digital ID card, which gives easy and secure access to data, to services. And this is a great enabler of, also of all sorts of e-participation uh, solutions. And all local, author and we have this ICT infrastructure, which we call X-Road, which the main principle, I'm not going into technical detail, but main principle is that people should not move, but data is moving. And all municipalities are also connected to same infrastructure which also creates very excellent basis for them to, to provide all sorts of services, but also all sorts of e-participation, e-engagement services. And this is very important to consider this wider context. Then of course, context matters also when we talk about starting a kind of e-engagement uh, concrete initiatives in, in our cities, in, in municipalities. When we started 2010, when I was invited uh, as an external consultant for my city, City Tartu, the second largest city in Estonia, we considered we had to keep in mind that our city uh, consists of so many different communities. This uh, concrete city context is very important if you start any kind of engagement initiative. At the same time, we are high-tech uh, startup center. At the same time, we had very, very vibrant hipster community. At the same time, we had very conservative university community because we are old university city. Though all those aspects uh, are very important to consider when you start. And of course, this also affect the models and tools, or sweet tools, what, what you are going to use and, and to what extent this technology should be integrated into your engagement models. We started very simple when I was asked, uh, invited to be consultant for city. 
2010, we started very, very, with very simple processes to engage citizens digitally. First ever initiative we, we launched uh, was using social media to compose uh, touristic materials only in a crowdsourcing method, in a way that all stories and photos were coming directly from citizens and just put together and published in, in city hall. So very simply showing and, and only social media was used. And this was quite a success story. And this encouraged and motivated city to do the, the next steps so we went further. Our next uh, civic engagement uh, initiative was already a bit more sophisticated. When city government was preparing for public transportation tender, uh, we, we, we got an idea that let's ask for citizens' feedback to, to bus routes and, and, and schedules, but we probably need to do it much more playful in order to motivate citizens to think and to, to be participating. So we also uh, let them to decide about the visual appearance of buses. And this was also used only social media, very, very easy and, and simple and, and affordable uh, platforms were used mostly in Facebook. And again, I mean, there was a lot of e-activism coming from citizens and, and, and by the end citizens decided and voted on which should uh, the, the bus, uh, public uh, buses look like in my city and, 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 and they, they look like, they still look like citizens have voted. And this again uh, encouraged us to go further. But of course, you, if you are deciding on budget, as we talk about participatory budgeting, you probably need some more sophisticated solutions because at least in my city, it is, it is thought that this is taxpayers' money. We cannot decide only using, I don't know, Facebook campaign and let citizens vote in Facebook. So all uh, one very good tool is used for participatory budgeting, which is electronic system, uh, which is in use in municipalities, which enables paperless council procedure, but at the same time, it enables legally binding uh, voting uh, using the same Estonian infrastructure. It, is, it, it enables full transparency. It enables uh, submission and uh, submission of ideas, but voting on ideas, commenting on ideas. So we were not going to invent a, a new wheel. We were using existing uh, solutions also for participatory budgeting because there was no more more secure uh, solutions needed for voting, especially. And I'm not going into detail of participatory budgeting model we use in Tartu because, I mean, it, it has been modified and I think this is the beauty of this, this game. Uh, I mean, it's came, I, I call it came, but I think that it is participatory budgeting is good learning by doing exercise. Uh, what I'm wanting to say is that, that we started being much more um, online model, but now uh, after each year we revise the model, we modify, and we have added actually many, many more offline components because I think the most efficient engagement initiatives are those which combine offline and, and online uh, online tools. So we have added, uh, which I think is very important in our model, we have more and more those activities like educating uh, uh, orders of ideas. We train them how to market, how to promote their ideas. We agree with them on code of good campaign, which is especially relevant in social media, how to promote the ideas and, and it, it should be ethical. And, and, and of course, it's, it's all, all is also an online, but at the same time, we keep all alternative possible because we don't want to discriminate anybody. So it is always possible to, to participate in online and offline way. And uh, yeah, the same, I would like to also to emphasize here how important it is to, to communicate your, in this case, to communicate participatory budgeting process in city, also using both tools uh, off and online. 
At the same time, we use also online spaces to, to introduce all ideas. At the same time, we bring photos and markets uh, uh, to the public uh, physical city space because in this way, this, this is even more, this campaign is even much more powerful. And, and what is also very important, uh, we, we of course encourage citizens themselves to promote the ideas, the, the whole process, and it has boosted a lot youth participation in, in this participatory budgeting process. So basically, uh, yeah, we, we see more and more those amazing campaigns and, and which triggers also more, more ideas from, from young uh, participants as well. And what is also important, how participatory budgeting as such as the process has impacted other processes and decision-making processes happening in the city. The model of participatory budgeting has proved to be so efficient, so good, that it has uh, started to be used also in, in many different urban planning uh, decision-making processes like the same model, crowdsourcing ideas using map solutions and only then bringing uh, some additional expertise to the table, organizing face-to-face -face meetings, though the model has, has started to, to really spread all across uh, the different decision-making uh, processes. And Tartu City was candidate city for European Cultural Capital 2024, successfully because the whole program actually was crowdsourced, crowdsourced by citizens, was co-created by citizens using again offline, but also online tools. So a very successful and encouraging example. So what are my takeaways? E-tools are definitely amplifiers, supporters or, of, of, of any kind of process, uh, communication process, engagement process, but they are not miraculous weapons. I, I would say that the most efficient processes uh, are those which combine both tools, offline and online. And what is also important, uh, start small but start now. A city that will never be probably the situation when you have the smartest uh, public servants, enough money. Uh, I mean, this will never <laughs> happen. So start rather start now, but start small, but start now and go bigger. And of course, there is no need to to invent something new, especially if we talk about platforms. Just adopt. And, and start using, re reusing the already existing platforms. And last but not least, engage citizens only when, when it is crystal clear and communicate uh, this to be crystal clear what is going to happen with citizens' contribution. So thank you very much for your attention. And <laughs> yes, you are. I'm, I will be looking forward to get your questions. Thank you, Cristina. Thank you for your, thank you very much for your presentation. The content uh, you have chosen to share with us is very current and challenging. Um, it was a, an excellent opportunity for learning for all of us. And please, if you can continue with us uh, for some more time, as yes. I am sure that your presentation will generate uh, curiosity from our participants. And now the stage is for Greta from Mexico uh, to share her presentation. Greta, muchas gracias por su participación en esta conferencia. Bueno, esperamos sus ideas para compartir con nosotros. Gracias. Muchas gracias, Nelson. I'm going to speak in English, uh, but uh, first of all, I have to say thank you to the European Local Democracy Week for the invitation. This panel is uh, full of very important and, and wise people. So I feel really honored to be uh, speaking next to you. Um, so I am Mexican. Uh, I live in Mexico City. Um, I work for Olin. Olin is an NGO that was founded nine years ago. And we work for Mexico to have rule of law, which is something that... Uh, for many of you might be granted, but for Mexicans it's not. So we're working for a country where the rule of law is the only rule. Um, 
And then we do this by uh, helping in democratic institutions be uh, fortified. Uh, but we also work with citizens. Um, something that we think is very, very important is the voice of uh, the people who live in this country. So one of the things that uh, we that we adopted as um, one of our methods for getting people to engage is participatory budgeting. Uh, so in all in, we use PB as a pretext, as an excuse to get people involved in democracy. Because here in Mexico, and I think around the world, no nobody really likes the idea of having to pay taxes, right? So when we tell them that uh, even though we have to pay taxes, there is a big chunk of those taxes that we can actually decide how to use. Number one, people don't believe it's true because PB in Mexico is not that popular. Uh, we, we, we have had uh, participation rates that go as high as 12%. So it's, it's really, we, we have really low participation when it comes to PB uh, voting. Um, and then uh, people really, really, really fall in love with, with the idea. They, some of them cannot believe that, that this actually happens, right? It's like, like, I have the right to propose how to use public money. It sounds like a dream, right? And one of the things that uh, PB in Mexico City, I have to say that PB in Mexico is not national. Like, like you guys have in Portugal, we have it uh, in several states in, in the Republic, but not everywhere. So in Mexico City, we have a big PB. I think it's, it's ranked fourth in the world because of the, of the amount of money that we get to decide how to use. It's around $50 million every year. So it is a lot of money. Um, and one of the particularities of PV here in Mexico City is that everyone is able to propose a project. Not everyone is able to vote, uh, only citizens can vote, but everyone is allowed to propose. This means that little kids can propose things. And uh, therefore, uh, in 2019, Oli launched a program to work with school kids for having them design their own PV projects so the strategy was that at first we didn't tell them what what was going on we just talked to them for like four months about uh the problems that they saw in their communities and we got problems that ranged from insecurity to um i don't know uh the kids did, did, didn't feel safe while crossing the street because because cars would go uh at, at very very high speeds um they thought the city was not clean enough. They had a problem with people smoking in public places and, and things like that. And then we, we helped them design specific solutions for the, for the problems that they, that they found. And then we told them they could make their, their, their solutions reality and they went crazy. It was amazing to see how their, uh, how they, understood that their ideas would be taken into account by the grown-ups to get implementation. So it was crazy and we had the kids going to their parents and, and telling them, hey, you have to vote, you have to be there, you have to go to the polls, you have to convince the neighbors, please, 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 this is important. So we actually increased uh, the number of kids that were involved in PV. So so last, last year, uh, there were 70 uh, different projects that, that were uh, registered by kids to the PV mechanism and 57 of those were from the, from the program that we were running. And I mean, I, I'm not here to brag about that. I'm here to explain um, why we think that PV is a, is a great democracy enhancer. And I think that it conveys to super important messages. The first one is that you as a citizen have the power to change whatever you don't like in your community and whatever that you feel is lacking and whatever that you feel needs to get attention, you actually can do it. And the second one and the most important one is that the way to do that is through democracy. It's through dialogue. It's through, through talking to your neighbor. It's through understanding which are the priorities in your community and how they should be addressed. 
Um, and we believe our, our what, what we're betting on is that these kids who are now doing PV projects on a regular scale, when they become 18 years old and they can vote in the in the not the PV elections but the 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 elections for our representatives, they will be very empowered and they will be um, having the information they need for making uh, important political decisions for our country. So that, that's why we are uh, working so hard with PV. And of course, PV in itself is a very uh, powerful mechanism that we want to foster and we want more people to get to know it. And, and going a little bit uh, on what Christina just said about technology, technology is indeed a very important tool that, that uh, we as citizens can use. Um, I will give you an example. So in Mexico City, we have had PV for uh, eight, eight or nine years now. Um, and there is not one single database where you can see what's going on with PV since 2011. So you have to rely on your memories to know what happened in your neighborhood with the, with the eight PV projects that have been approved uh, year by year. And this, this is something that involves public money. So there should be a, a database available. So since the government was not uh, very interested in having this information public for several reasons, uh, we as civil society uh, built up a website where uh, we are still working on it, but, but we are going to be able to portray what has been happening since 2011 until today relating to every PV project that has been approved in the city and what happened with that money because not every PV project that gets approved gets uh, built or gets done. And then what happens with that money? There is no transparency. There is a lot of um, loopholes in the law and in the implementation that we're trying to find and, and, and get solutions for them. I am running out of time, so I'm going to be very, very quickly uh, talking about COVID. And then we had COVID. And COVID in Mexico, um, as in the world, has been something that took us by surprise and that, that we really do not know how to control. But also COVID uh, in the democratic arena and in the not democratic arena has been an excuse to, to use as a, as, a, as a tool to suspend some of our rights. So in Mexico City, PB is a right. Participatory budgeting is embedded in the constitution as a citizen's right. And then uh, using the excuse of uh, COVID uh, and, and not being able uh, to have a citizen gatherings in the city, the local Congress um, in, in the past months, I think it was around August, they decided that this year, even though the PV uh, consult had already passed and we had already voted for which projects were were supposed to be uh, happening this year, they decided to suspend the use of public money for those projects until next year. So right now we are uh, dealing with a situation in which one of our political rights has been suspended, um, of course, due to an emergency, but we believe that there is a possibility that this money from the PV has been used for something else and that we're not getting it back. So right now we are uh, consolidating a coalition of, of NGOs that are going to make sure that that money comes away, I'm, I'm sorry, comes back to PV and to the original uh, things that it was designed for and that the city government cannot use it for something else. And I'm going to stop right now because 10 minutes have passed. So thank you very much. Uh, and I'm very happy to hear if you have any questions. Greta, thank you very much for your presentation. It was very interesting to learn about your work in Mexico City, one of the largest cities in the world with many, many social, economic and environmental challenges. And the last presentation of this conference is from Dominique from Canada. Dominique, thank you very much for your participation. 
Oh, thank you very much for inviting me. It's been a pleasure. I've uh, heard from uh, European Democra uh, Democracy uh, Week for a long time now, and we've been uh, kind of eager to see if we could do about the same thing in Montreal, which has not happened yet, but it's interesting to be participating in that conference. Um, I'm going to share my, uh, my presentation with you guys in just a second, excuse me, um, to talk about a bit about Montreal. I'm going to be talking a bit about Montreal and uh, what we have as democratic tools here. What I, the, the, the kind of disadvantage of uh, speaking last is the fact that a lot of what we do has been already um, has been already presented by other cities. So it's interesting to see that we're very uh, trendy in that uh, in that field. But um, Montreal is quite an interesting city in terms of uh, citizens participation. Can any, can everybody see my uh, my presentation? Yes. Good. Thank you. Yes. So just to remind you, this is an image that people that knows me already uh, have seen a lot. This is Montreal. Uh, like you can see, Montreal is normally a very participative uh, city because this is uh, the month of February and it's uh, minus 30 degrees outside and people are still out and still partying and still participating and still very much uh, inclined. It's, um, it's an important... Uh, Sorry, it's an important city. It's the second largest city in Montreal, in Canada, and it has about uh, a little bit more than two million inhabitants. And if you take the the big region, then it's three point five, which is half the residents of the uh, province of Quebec. So it's very important to uh, to uh, to see what Montreal represents in terms of Canadian. Public consultations have been an important part of our democracy for a long time. Um, it started in, in the mid 70s and it's been going very, very strong since then. Uh, people are asking to be consulted. They want to be a part of uh, improving the projects that are presented. Uh, those, those consultations are made either by uh, city officials, private firms or us. And since 2002, we've been created just to make sure that there's a neutral third party that can uh, kind of present uh, the public consultation and the citizen engagement in Montreal, and also that can dictate rules of engagement, basically. So since uh, 2002, uh, there, there's been new ways for people to ask for public consultation or citizen engagement in Montreal. So as I said, we were created in 2002 and we have three, place it three parts in our mandates. The first one is to consult Montrealers on uh, any subject that, that, is the, that is designed, sorry, by the Montreal City Council or their committee or the executive committee. Also to propose regulation to make sure that most of the public consultation that are made in our cities are credible and efficient and, uh, and have some effectiveness in it. We reflect also on best practices, which uh, is very interesting when we're part of uh, big networks like uh, the OEDP, for example. Usually our consultation were divided in three parts. The first part that was information. Then we do hearings, public hearings of uh, people who want to speak about the project and report. We've been starting since I've been uh, named president in 2014. We've been engaging more and more into online method of consulting people. What you have to, to remember is that for us, we're, um, we're mainly talking about real estate projects in Montreal, plans, policy, charters. Uh, for example, we'll do the cultural policy of the city or the we just did the uh, uh, what we call the 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 mixed uh, mixed city the mixed city plan, which was the idea of having people of different uh, backgrounds being able to to afford and uh, to find places to live in Montreal. We are mandated on community and institutional equipments and assets, 
But since uh, 2014, we've been, we've been added one, one area of our mandate, which is called the right to initiative. And the right to initiative means that the citizens that feel that there's a subject that hasn't been tackled by the city, and that's not the object of uh, current policy or bylaws, could be addressed at this point. And it's been used uh, a lot since 2014. And the last one we did, which is very important because it took all, almost a two years process, was uh, a rights of initiative on uh, systemic discrimination and racism in, Mon in the Montreal uh, competencies, which means that uh, we had over 7,000 people participate in there. But the particularity of the right of initiative is that you cannot only complain about something, you have to propose solutions that are implementable. So we had more than 7,000 participants uh, working towards solution, which are being implemented. We, we, we made public our report in, um, in last uh, June, actually, a couple of weeks after the, the death of, uh, of George Floyd. And we can already see the different part of the solution that were brought uh, forward by the people being implemented in, uh, in Montreal which is uh, quite interesting. And it's also spilling, I would say, uh, at other levels of the provincial and federal government as well. So that's quite interesting to see how a citizen's initiative can be taken so seriously and have such, a, such an impact on what can be done in the city. For us, when, when uh, the pandemic came, and I could, I, I'll, I'll tell you more about uh, our work because 10 minutes is really a short time, but one of the challenges we had when the pandemic came is that first of all, they suspended everything uh, in Montreal in terms of public gathering uh, as they did, uh, I guess, uh, in most places of the world. And uh, for us, it wasn't so much of a trouble because we didn't really have new mandates that were going on that we were going to start. We were writing our reports, so that allowed us to do uh, most of the report. And it also allowed us to start talking to the people that usually participate in our, uh, in, in our processes. So what we did is that we called back by telephone everybody that had participated in person uh, in one of our process for, three, for, for the past three years to ask them how they saw, uh, what the challenges were and how they saw uh, how, uh, how they thought we could start again to uh, have public consultation. And, we ha and from there, we, we, we created what, what we called our COVID method, which is, uh, I would say, mainly an online and written method. But uh, we did take in the literacy levels very, very, for us, it was very important to make sure that we had ways to communicate with the people that would take care, that would uh, take into account the literacy level, the availability of the people, because now most people are, have the kids at home, they're working from home, so it's kind of difficult to participate if we tell them to come at a certain time or a certain place. So we had to do what we call the asynchron participation, so making sure that all the elements were there so that whenever they had the time, they could do it. The fact that most of the, the what we call les tiers lieu, the third places, you know, the cafes, the libraries, the, where people could go and get, for example, free internet, the fact that it was closed um, was a problem. So we, we reverted back, I would say, to the old methods, meaning how can we use the telephone? How can we use the postal system? How can we make uh, documents available to you in your house? How can you return it to us? Like having prepaid postage um, kits that were sent and saying, send us back your opinion if you don't have access to internet, write it back. And we started uh, getting, uh, getting uh, a lot of uh, feedback from that. And people, I would say they, they were very appreciative of the fact that we took time to talk to them and design a method that uh, they felt part of, so they recognized themselves. And one of the things that I think is quite interesting in that, uh, in that level is that we can, we can compare when we had the non-COVID 
um, um, consultation and the participation that was there and what, it, and what we're having now in terms of participation now that we're using mostly online methods, but we're really hoping that soon we'll get, we're gonna be able to come back to, um, to, uh, to our traditional in-person method because most of the innovations that we were doing were done in person. Uh, one of the things that we realize is that there's a big loss of interaction. Um, if I think of the three mandates that we've had since we've been doing that online method, the big difference is that when we were in person, people used to listen to whoever came before them. They would go to activities that would have like round tables or, or uh, games trying to, you know, like prospective games trying to imagine the future or we would ask them to put themselves in the place of somebody else and then uh, go further. And, um, and that kind of constructed a dialogue. Now, what we're thinking is that if we have a very controversial subject, we might not be able to, to create that same thing uh, with an online engagement. Or if we do create it, we might not have everybody sitting at the table. Because what we realize is that if we have not experienced a real loss into participation by the fact that we went online, the people that are participating are very different. Now we have a lot of 25, 35 year old, which we didn't have before. Well, we had some, but it was about less than 5%. Now they're like 40, 45%. So they're the ones that are most used to those kinds of uh, interaction. Uh, same thing, we lost, we had a lot of uh, older people, 50 years old, 55, 60, 65 and older that would participate that are now not participating in as a broad number as they were before. So that also for us is a, is a very important challenge. Uh, uh, the timing also is, uh, is of essence because I would say we, ha we used to have a process that was, well, I talked about the one in the rights of initiative that, that uh, lasted about two years, but we, our normal processes are around 120, 150 days. And now we're seeing that since we want to give people time to uh, really take in the information and be able to react, then it takes a lot, uh, a lot longer. So that's also something that we have to consider. Um, I would say, whoops, did I lose one? Yeah. So I would say in terms of lesson learned, and, I, and I'll stop there, there would be a lot more to say but uh, I guess hopefully I'll get a chance to exchange with you in the, in the question period. So I'll stop with that. The lesson that we have learned is that, first of all, it's not enough to be well-intentioned. You have to be really genuine and concerned about inclusion if you want it to happen. So going back to the people and asking them to be part of the design process and we're doing an evaluation as we go along on each new thing that we are implementing uh, evaluation with the people, by the people, is quite interesting to have it as an um, ongoing learning process, I would say. Uh, the second thing we learn is that uh, light springs from the chaos. So basically, that means that if you want to do community engagement in this pandemic, you have to kind of be, you have to be kind to yourself and, and require some kind of discomfort to, pro to uh, protect the process. That means for us that basically uh, we had a part of our process that was very predictable. Now we give ourselves permission to say, okay, this, this group is not participating. Let's try to implement things that were not uh, foreseen at first, but that could help them participate. Uh, the fact also that the, um, the, the rules are changing every week. You know, one week they say, okay, you can have in-person meeting. And then two weeks later, they'll say, no, people have to go back into confinement. So you really have to embrace the chaos and just uh, let your creativity, um, and just let your creativity flow. And finally, is that we must have the courage to put ourselves in a posture of listening so we can create safe spaces and participatory spaces around us because uh, more and more people are feeling vulnerable and they want to get some kind of a sense of, uh, 
of uh, taking charge again of their own lives. So uh, we feel that the public consultation and citizen engagement uh, processes that we're having are permitting exactly that. And this is uh, one thing that is very important to us. So basically, that's it. If you want to have more information, you can go back to our website and see ocpm.qc.ca and see all our methods. Because one of the things that I should have said when we began is that for us, uh, the part what, what the, our credibility is based on is the fact that everything is transparent. So if you want to see the tools that we're using for engagement, if you want to see the reports, if you want to see uh, the different citizens' participation, everything is on our website since 2002 till today. Thank you very much. Dominic, thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. <clears throat> and with this presentation, we conclude the trip around the world. Six countries and six continents were represented on this conference. It was, I think, a fashion and journey around the planet. And now we can start the debate. We have more or less 25 minutes for this. Um, participants can ask for the floor, turn on the micro and present their questions. Or if you prefer, you can also write the questions in the chat. Um, and while you think about the questions, maybe I can suggest Carlos Sosa to, to share with us the work he's been doing. Carlos, can you share with us now or you prefer oh. to share only at the end? Uh, better in the end, I'm still updating the communication from Dominic, I think I will be able to show something in uh, five minutes. Okay, that's perfect. Thank you. So, Thank you, Nelson. No, it's okay, it's, it's perfect. Thank you, Carlos. So, um, questions, please use your microphone and present or share just your ideas with the participants. We are more than 50 people in this room, so I know that you have a lot of questions. I can actually see one question <laughs> addressing me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, any objections on the electronic ID card for all people? Well, in Estonia, it is compulsory and everybody has it. So obviously in, in, in our country, <laughs> there are no objections, but, but somehow, yes, I know that it has, hasn't been so successfully implemented in any, any other countries. Well, I'm not the person who can say why, <laughs> but, but yeah, the, I can imagine there are all sorts of legal issues, of course, you have to probably change your legal environment, legal framework, and so, so we were fortunate starting from zero, from scratch, building our state already, integrating all those electronical components into our, our state bureaucracy, I would say, so. <laughs> <clears throat> Just a small comment or answer to, to this question. Thank you, Christina. More participants can ask their questions. I think that one of the most common questions in the different presentations was the use of new technologies. Um, so I don't, I don't know, for example, if Christina or uh, Amelia or Mr. Chin, well, all our, our participants, if you think that this could be the, the future of public participation or it's just a tendency. About technology? 
Whoops. Yes. <laughs> you go first. You go first. No, I follow no. you. <laughs> well, for us, what I can say, what I wanted to say really fast was that uh, uh, it's clear to us that there's going to be a before COVID time and an after COVID time. And most of the online engagement tools are there. Well, some of them are there to stay. And they are going to be uh, a bit like Christina was saying before, they are going to be uh, an interesting part of our processes in the future. It's going to be both online and offline as soon as uh, the condition permits it. But we cannot minimize the, the increase in participation that we have observed in Montreal, for example, uh, and the new groups that we are touching uh, to the online uh, engagement. So we have to consider that in future mandates. Thank you. Thank you, Dominique. Mr. Chin. Yeah. So the, the in Korea, the, we successfully uh, have contained the coronavirus pandemic. So at the moment, we have only like uh, less than 100 cases a day out of 50 million people. So around 50 to 60 every day. Uh, this kind of containment was possible because of the use of technology, tracing technology. So at the beginning of the tracing, there was quite a lot of objection from people. And then, but uh, through, uh, by modification to accommodate to the problems of privacy infringement, at the moment, there is no, almost no objection because all the information is uh, like uh, nullified or deleted after two weeks of the possible carriers of coronavirus. But still, uh, through the experience I have here, uh, in the future, I really be believe that the democracy is really important. Without democracy, the using advanced technology will infringe the privacy of people. Probably we may end up as a like a health dictatorship in the future. So with more technology, I believe we need more democracy. If I may add here something. Yes, of course. <laughs> yeah, a few moments I would, or a few aspects I would like to highlight here is that when in, in Estonia, why I, I was not touching up on COVID thing or COVID situation so much that, well, in, in Estonia, really the, the readiness and already common practice was so much related to, to online, online environment and that everything was happening also in online environments that it was not affecting so heavily actually even I mean municipalities were functioning fully online and council meetings were anyway transmitted online and everything but what I see now is somehow opposite process that people are so much eager to participate offline to to come physically to to dawn hall and and luckily enough we can we can have that because in estonia the covid has been well i we still can cannot say it fully but but our state of emergency was really very short one and 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 i mean we were back to normal quite soon in summer already and we could organize all also related to our uh, this year's participatory budgeting edition already offline as well and i see that there are even more people coming physically actually to those physical meetings than it was before because everybody is sort of tired of of, of online things and webinars and people are really happy to see each other and final thing is that if we talk about youth participation i have done different projects with 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 young people and 
within a uh, framework of one European project I'm currently running with, with young people. Actually, the young people themselves argue that they are not taking social media so seriously. I mean, they don't want, it is purely entertainment for them, what is happening there. They want to discuss various, serious and real issues face to face and or somewhere in, in other environments. So this is also something I think we should keep in mind when we, we plan or design different initiatives. Thank you. Thank you, Cristina. Um, Nelson, posso dizer alguma coisa? Sim. Só, eu ia colocar-lhe uma questão, eh, eh, mas vou só colocar a questão em inglês e depois posso fazer em português só para, para que os, os restantes participantes possam acompanhar. Mas na realidade nós temos diferentes realidades nesta conferência, não é? Eu ia exatamente colocar a questão ao Presidente Calixto sobre o uso das novas tecnologias em Moçambique, porque eu estou em querer que sem participação face a face, uma interação face a face no caso da Matola e de outros, de outros municípios de Moçambique, é muito difícil promover a participação e sobretudo dos bairros mais vulneráveis de, dos municípios. Não sei se concorda comigo e deixe-me só fazer esta questão em inglês para depois explicar aos, aos restantes participantes, se estiver de acordo. Well, I was explaining to President Calisto from Matol and Mozambique that we have very different realities at this conference. Um, the use of new technologies that doesn't have the same strength in Mozambique, for example. Without a face-to-face -face interaction, it is very difficult to promote participation, especially in the most vulnerable neighborhoods in Matol or in Maputo or in other municipalities in Mozambique. So this is the question to President Calisto, if he agree with this. Please, President, por favor. Tudo bem. Uh, bom, Nelson, é assim, eu acho que, na verdade, com esta pandemia, o mundo jamais voltará a ser o mesmo. Uh, não há dúvidas que o uso das tecnologias é um desafio que todos nós uh, devemos abraçar. Uh, pois embora tenhamos essas diferentes realidades, não há dúvidas, mesmo no primeiro mundo, nem todos uh, uh, têm esta capacidade de dominar em plena tecnologia, mas uh, 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 é necessário, de fato, que olhemos para o futuro uh, com esta solução, não outra alternativa. Certamente gostaríamos de estar todos juntos, tal como estava a dizer a Dominique, nos abraçarmos, a Cristian também dizia que nós temos a vontade de nos juntarmos, tal como fazíamos antes, mas do ponto de vista de participação nas nossas cidades, tendo em conta os estratos sociais que nós temos, os níveis também de acesso às tecnologias, os níveis de pobreza que nós temos, há toda uma necessidade de promovermos uh, uh, o uso mas, uh, uh, massivo das tecnologias. Certamente que uh, 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 a questão que se coloca é como ter... Uh, 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 digamos, soluções financeiras para que efetivamente toda a gente possa ter acesso. É um desafio, nós temos que olhar para as nossas, as nossas cidades, cada um trazer a sua experiência de como é que uh, 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 tem estado a fazer e partilhar essas experiências, chamando a consciência de todos que não há outra solução senão uh, 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 esta via do uso das tecnologias. Nós, como Matola, estamos desafiados, o país no seu todo tem estado a promover o uso das tecnologias, porque a solução que nós temos, aliás, olhando para o, 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 o aparelho em si, se eu falar, por exemplo, do telefone, no nosso país até zonas recondes já tem telefone, mas aí está, será que o telefone que nós estamos a usar nos nossos dos nossos bares ou no, no, no campo tem uh, uh, acesso à, à internet, por exemplo, a esta, a, esta, a, esta, a esta pergunta que eu posso lançar, para dizer que estamos desafiados a encontrar dentro dos nossos programas um mecanismo que possa olhar para esta linha de uso da tecnologia como prioridade, porque de fato com esta pandemia não há dúvidas que o mundo não voltará a ser, a ser o mesmo. Eu não imagino quando é que voltaremos, por exemplo, a estar de uma forma presencial numa conferência do IDP ou noutras conferências para discutir a vida das cidades. Não será tão já, é preciso 
a própria Organização Mundial da Saúde decretar o fim da pandemia, quando não sabemos. Então, a solução que temos, Nelson, é esta medida, maximizar o uso das tecnologias, buscando até soluções financeiras para que as nossas populações a nível das cidades possam ter acesso a, 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 esta, a estas plataformas. Muito obrigado. Muito obrigado, Presidente Calisto, pelos seus contributos. I don't know if other guests or participants want to add something on this topic. Please. Well, maybe now we can ask Carlos. Carlos, are you available to share with us something? Yes, I'm going to share the screen now. Okay, thank you very much for your um, presentations. It was a pleasure to listen to you and try to record um, most of our important um, items. It was difficult to select because you were saying so much important stuff to, to participation and to a local democracy that it was really amazing to, um, to start this process. So we started with, um, we started with uh, Bryony. Okay, Brian he was um, representing the Council of Europe. Um, the quality on, on the video is not the, the same I have in my iPad. I, I will send you then the, the complete, um, the, the final thing. So the, the, what is showing on, on the, what the, 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 the shared screen is the, a little bit depixel, but um, what I have is a little bit more. Um, okay, so uh, Brian, he was talking us a little bit about, about the perspective of the Council of Europe, about the celebration of the European Democracy Week, Local Democracy Week and saying that the Council of Europe is uh, inviting citizens to enroll on the construction of democracy. Um, the Council of Europe also believes that uh, this week is an instrument, an essential instrument to the promotion of local democracy. And she was uh, mentioning that trust is, is, is fundamental on the, the creation of a process of participation democracy. Um, Bryony was also highlighting the city of Balongo as an uh, example of commitment of promotion of citizenship and, and, and um, uh, something related with that. Um, we were also listening to um, Adria, so he was the moderator from, from Spain and he was introducing all the guests. So I will finish this slide when I have a little bit more time. So basically he was um, keynoting the people that were going to present during the, um, the webinar. Uh, we also had with us Nelson Diaz. Um, Nelson was doing uh, some questions and moderating the time and interviewing most of the time uh, um, with all the speakers. So the, the work was moderated by Nelson and by, and by Adria. And now we are jumping into the processes step. So we started with, um, with Laie from Australia and, and she was talking about this transition for community engagement. So they are in a different um, position regarding how to engage people and it's not citizen engagement, it's community engagement. And um, they are seeing that communities is, is important to be involved on this, on this process. And that in, in Australia, the, is the public services that are somehow promoting and engaging communities through this role. Um, she was also mentioning COVID-19. Um, she says that this is an opportunity to, to enroll more and more citizens on the democratic processes. So they are having a, um, a position that this is an opportunity to engage more and more citizens regarding uh, COVID situation. Okay, let's jump for um, uh, Mr. Shin Gyeonggu from South Korea. And he was highlighting the value of democracy. And, and connecting democracy and uh, human rights. So basically the, this importance of connecting this uh, young uh, democracy as a value in a young country like South Korea, and that citizenship and human rights are, are values that are present on actual democracy in South Korea. 
uh, he was highlighting as well that the concept of, of participative citizenship is developed in South Korea with an uh, um, investment on education. So education is real important to prepare and enroll citizens for a more active role on, on, on democracy and, and participation and citizenship. Okay, we are moving on um, to the mayor of Matala, city in Mozambique. Uh, he was like highlighting that this city in Mozambique is, is developing high role, important role on the promotion of democracy, participative democracy in the country of Mozambique. So um, it was in, they are involved in the promotion of democracy through many models and also to promoting a very important role in the National Association of uh, Municipalities of Mozambique. Okay. So we are now moving to uh, Greta Rios from Mexico, and she was highlighting the role of NGOs and the, the civil society on the, the, the promotion role of, of, um, of participative participate democracy. So in Mexico, the citizenship, the participating citizenship is also promoted uh, and mainly promoted by the, the national movement of citizens, organized citizens of movements in NGOs. She's also regarding and ex explaining your example as the founder of Alin, one NGO that promotes the affirmation of citizenship and further promotion of uh, um, participative policies. Let's move a little bit further. So we also had our participation of Christina. Christina is coming from, the, from Estonia and she was highlighting the uh, investment of, of Estonia on e-participation. Uh, she was also referring that uh, Estonia was one of the first countries to implement the electronic vote um, and that the, all the this, uh, participative policies in Estonia are exploring the capacity for e, e capacity, so the digital capacity in promoting citizenship. Uh, many things were spoken by Christina, e participation, e governance, e citizenship, and she was giving uh, clear examples about how Estonia and the city of Tartu are developing this approach. Okay, and now we were listening to uh, Dominique Olivier from Canada, uh, highlighting as well the role in Montreal, city from Canada, and the participation in Canada is a challenge for the new, the, the modern citizenship. Um, all the tools are available on, on the, um, the, 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 the websites and the processes um, of the Montreal city. Everybody are invited to engage uh, into this um, policy. So as you can see, uh, we were developing, okay, I have something here with the projection. I will try to connect again with my iPad. Thank you, Carlos. Yeah. Great, great, it was great. Thank you Thank very you. much. Yeah, this is still a, a, a um, task in ongoing, so I will update with more uh, information that I was taking from the keynote speakers. And then I will make um, a final poster with all the presentations and make a final, a final um, draw with all the people that were involved in this panel on this European democracy, local democracy week promoted by the city of Valongo. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nelson. Well, and now I pass the word to Claudia, who has done an exceptional work in organizing this conference. And I'm sure that her contribution was fundamental for the success of this initiative. Claudia has something to ask all of you to, to share with us your ideas, your evaluation about this conference. And from my part, I thank the invitation of the municipality of Valongo. And I want to congratulate the mayor of Valongo and the team of Valongo for this excellent work, excellent work that you are doing. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nelson. You are too kind. Uh, thank you all very much for your presence. Special thanks to Briani and our mayor for the opening of the conference and also, of course, the speakers, the moderators and Carlos, our graphic designer. It was a pleasure to count on your participation in this conference. This sharing of experiences and knowledge was very enriching, enriching and interesting. I left 
a link in the chat, as you can see, and we ask you to open it and to describe this session in one word. You can see the result of the word, um, the word cloud on the screen. My, my colleague will share it. And we suggest you to follow our Facebook page, uh, FEDO, and um, the event of the European Local Democracy Week in Bolongo, which will take, which will take place until November, and we will invite you to participate. Thank you very much, and have a nice day. It was a pleasure to be here. We are ending this conference. Thank you, goodbye. Goodbye, thank, thank you. you. Bye, yes. goodbye. Bye. Thank you, bye-bye. Bye-bye, thank you. Hello, Christina. Hello. Hello, how are you? <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> well. <clears throat> we are still with the uh, Menti open. Nelson, que show? Não se está a ouvir. Gostei imenso. Foi uma, uma viagem, uma viagem sem sair de casa. Yeah. I was asking Cristina and Nelson uh, his opinion. It was very nice the idea of the the designer. Yeah, yeah, brilliant, brilliant. Yes, yes it was. Wonderful. <laughs> so thank you, Carlos Souza. You're a very skillful guy. Thank really. you very much. Yeah, it was a bit difficult because um, it was a lot of information and tried of to pick course. up the highlights.